Hi everyone, my name is Tanya Rudikevich. Uh, I'm a student at Harvard Extension School and I am making this video to present my final project on TensorFlow and neural networks for visual art generation. When I was researching this project I came across um, literally dozens of different types of algorithms that are used to generate visual art in different ways um, and I wanted to take a minute right at the beginning to go over some of the cooler things I found and considered. So what the first image here uh, on the upper right, you can see the input here is a string of handbags in different styles and the output is a shoe in the similar style of the handbag. And This is um, created using an algorithm called a disco GAN that I'll go into GANs more later because I ended up using a GAN for this project. So Here's my problem statement, what I wanted to do with visual art generation. So my goal was to build a generator to create illustrated letters um, using TensorFlow and neural networks. You can see some examples on the bottom uh, of, the, of the screen here, this WSTE. Um, these are from the data set that I actually used. So this is an example of generating entirely new artwork based on a training set of existing art. So this training data. So this training data comes from the British Library's Flickr account. Um, they published a huge data set of images from books, um, including lots of maps, and this album of 1,500 approximately illustrated letters and um, typography images. So I chose this data because uh, public domain images. Um, I'm hoping that the letters will be easy for the machine learning algorithm to pick up, the deep learning algorithm to pick up. Um, and the images can be generated in black and white without losing a lot of information. So the link to the photos are below. You should go check it out. They have um, a lot of map data as well that I also considered using, but I thought the fine lines and maps might be a little bit of a challenge for the algorithm to replicate. So here's some of the algorithms for image generation I mentioned before. Um, just wanted to go over a brief introduction to what these are. So I considered a bunch of these. Um, so the two big categories I looked at were variational autoencoders and GANs, which is generative adversarial networks, and they've both been used for visual art generation. Um, I decided to go with a Wasserstein GAN, which is a GAN that's been uh, adapted to take the Wasserstein loss function, and there are a couple other changes that I'll go more into detail later, and that's came out, the paper came out um, in early 2017, I think January, so how do GANs work? So with GANs you have a generator network and a discriminator network. And for this one in particular you take in one data set of real images, can be unlabeled, um, and you have the discriminator and the generator. The discriminator determines the probability that the given image, the input image into the discriminator, is part of the real image set, which is the training set. The generator tries to generate images well enough to trick the discriminator. And the two models are trained concurrently, which is why GANs are adversarial. So the generator tries to get better and create better images to trick the discriminator. And the discriminator tries to get better at recognizing what are the fake images and the real images, right? Because it gets this white noise from the GAN that it knows is fake. So if you train them together, they, they uh, complement and the loss function is a composite of both the generator and the discriminator loss. So technology and software for this project. So my Python is 2.7.13 um, TensorFlow 1.4 to create and run the neural networks. Um, some Python packages that were used in Python 2.7 here. So everything is done in a Jupyter Notebook, which I'm, if you're not familiar with, they're awesome and great for organizing and seeing your output as you're doing it. And TensorBoard for visualizing loss functions graphically. So TensorBoard comes with TensorFlow. Um, and what you can do is you can add summaries while you're running your al and training your um, deep learning algorithm. You can add summaries to the tensor board and make graphs of your loss function as you go. So let's take a look at this in the code. Okay. So here we're importing these packages that I mentioned, uh, TensorFlow, Hill, um, you get this handy uh, using TensorFlow backend error, which is from Keras. Um, Keras is officially part of TensorFlow now, but I think this might be an older function of it. 
Um, this is a handy helper function that I leaned on heavily from one of my resources, and I'll put all the resources at the end. And what it does is it takes in um, a group of a, a list of samples, and it plots the images for you in a in a four by four grid. So we'll use that to look at the output. Um, the images I told you about. You can download them all from Flickr and save them into a file, into a directory, and this is the path to my directory. Um, so for file in the path, you append it, and you make a list of all the file names. And what this code will do is show you, um, will show you an example of t the first 20 images in in the file names list, um, and it will also show you what the image will look like when it's reshaped. Because what I did was I reshaped it to a 28 by 28 with the with the colors adjusted. That's what this true part is here, um, and this is just to show like if the file name has an extension that where it can't load the image, it'll say it's not an image. All right, so uh, I actually already ran this for you guys. I started running it. So you can see here's an example of a very stretched out O um, that gets compressed into this weird pixel shape. Uh, same, you get see the T compressed. You can see the, the resolution on a 28 by 28 image is not really enough for this training data. Um, and it would be really interesting to redo this project with better resolution um, or better, uh, a larger image size for these training images. Same thing here, you see the M, it turns into this uh, gateway into Mars. Um, I, I'm not even sure why this is in the letter set. I guess that's an I there. It looks like a bush. Um, yeah, so we'll see if, uh, if this algorithm can take this really messy input data and turn it into, turn it into art. I'm a little bit doubtful here, but art is what you, what you, uh, what you, what you, Art is creative. This is this is creativity. So the discriminator. So uh, if you are not in ComSci 63, you can ignore this homework 12 part. But I followed the basic architecture for the discriminator um, that we saw in that homework. So there are two convolutional network layers. The first takes the image um, and finds 64 features, and the second takes that first layer and finds 32 features. And then it's followed by two connected layers. Um, so those layers. You see over here, you can imagine this is that first um, convolutional layer. It takes it and turns it into um, uh, features, the, the input, the real images, or the generated fake images, depending on the case. And then it takes that and it turns it into a smaller set of features, it's kind of focusing it. Um, so one choice I made, instead of a ReLU activation function, I'll show you this in a second for nonlinearity, I used a leaky ReLU with an alpha of 0 0.01. Um, so leaky ReLUs are similar, similar to ReLUs, um, but less fragile. So instead of taking the max of 0 and x, it computes uh, so a very small mul multiple of x when x is less than 0, and x itself when x is greater than or equal to 0. And I also chose to use max pooling over average pooling, because max pooling learns outlines and edges better. I was hoping it would pick up those letters more easily. So here's our discriminator. So first we reset the TensorFlow graph, and we establish these variables. So these two are the weights and biases for the first layer of the convolutional network. So conv1 corresponds to the first layer. You can see they're used down here. Um, second layer, first layer of the fully connected part of the discriminator, and the second layer of the fully connected part. So for one convolutional, two convolutional, one fully connected, two fully connected. And the way this looks here is we create the convolutional layer with the weight, um, used equal strides and padding, uh, and then we add the bias. And then here's where we add the activation function, which is the leaky ReLU. Um, and then here you can see the max pool, which I decided to use instead of the average pool because of the, the edges being sharper. You can see a similar layer here. The difference is the weights in the first layer, you go to 32 features, and in the second, it takes in 32 features, puts out 44, 64. Um, great, now we see the fully connected layer. It takes in that max pool. 
um, the weights and the biases, and another leaky ReLU. Same thing at the, at the end, we get the weights, biases, no leaky ReLU, and the fully connected layer, the second fully connected layer when we return it. Great. Back to the PowerPoint. All right, so you can see here's the, the code for the discriminator. All right, now the generator. So I based the generator architecture off of O'Reilly's uh, GANs for Beginners tutorial. And you can see the sources. It was really helpful, um, and I highly recommend it if this is your first time learning about GANs. So there are four layers in the generator. The first takes in a 100 by 100 array of white noise, and it turns it into um, 7 by 7 by 64 features. There's also batch normalization that happens here, and batch normalization uh, normalizes the output, so you don't have to worry about the variation in the white noise features. It will be significantly different. So then we turn that first layer. This is kind of an inverted discriminator, so it goes to 64 features, then to 32 features, and then into image output. And I also added like a, an end function here that um, restricts the values between negative 1 and 1. And I chose to use TanH. You could also use Sigmoid. Um, and it, it adds to the crispness of the image. So I again use leaky ReLU instead of ReLU as the activation function. So we can see what this looks like in code over here. We've got the generator 1 weight and bias, generator 2 weight and bias. There's the 31, 36, 64, 64 to 32 in the generator 3 layer, and then 32 to 1 in the fourth generator. So you can see it kind of goes similarly. We have we multiply by the weight, add the weight and the bias, reshape, batch norm, leaky relu. Same thing, you got the batch norm, leaky relu. And then finally at the end, we restrict between negative 1 and 1 for this tan h. I realized I just forgot to run these. All right, so then we go to our placeholder variables. So here's the input noise to the generator, input images to the discriminator. Um, these just hold their place in TensorFlow until we're ready to work with them. Um, generated images from white noise, uh, discriminator predictions for the true images, and for the generated image. And our batch size is going to be 100 because we want to run this in smaller batches that mix up the data a little bit and also prevent it from trying to take in too much at once. All right, so let's go back to the PowerPoint to talk a little bit about the loss function. So the loss function for Wasserstein GAN is a little bit different than for Fresnel GANs. So for Fresnel GANs, you compute the distance below. And notice that it takes in both some of the loss from the discriminator and the loss from the generator. So instead of the discriminator, a, a different block recommends that we should call it a critic. Um, it needs to be trained more than the generator, um, and there are no longer logarithms in the probability, and you can see what that looks like here. So the implementation of the loss function, full credit to uh, Augustus Christiadi here, um, the discriminator loss is the reduced mean of the discriminator, or the discriminator evaluation of the real images is d of x, subtract the reduced mean of the discriminator um, of the fake images created by the generator. And then the generator loss is the negative of the reduced mean of the fake images created by the generator. For optimization, I used RMS prop optimizer with a learning rate of um, 5 times 10 to the negative, what is that, fifth? Yeah, um, based on some recommendations for WGANs from this is Augustus Christiani's blog again. So here's what that looks like in code. Well, I'll run that in a second. Um, so RMS prop, based on um, this lecture from Toronto, is a sped up version of mini batch learning. So it adjusts the learning rate during training. All right, so we'll go and run that. So to initiate a session for TensorFlow, you have to do this uh, ses.run. So, and this will initiate all of the placeholder variables we set up. Right now we can run that, get that set up. Critic needs to train more than the generator in a WGAN, or the, the discriminator, we also call the critic sometimes. So here I started calling it the critic. So the critic in this implementation receives five iterations of training for every one iteration the generator has. 
um, and the TensorBoard summaries are updated every 10 generator iterations. This uh, choice of training for five times, the, the discriminator five times for every one iteration of the generator, I also took from um, the uh, Augustus Christiati blog, um, which I found very helpful. Great. And so this first one, you're feeding in the true images, um, white noise, right? And the generator loss you're getting from the generator solver, which is our optimizer um, generator loss, and you're feeding it the white noise. Okay, so the loss functions I actually want to show you in TensorBoard. And then here we can see the discriminator loss, um, which started off, I don't know if it, uh, nope. Um, it started off uh, somewhere around zero and quickly shot up to around 42,000, um, I think that is. And remember, in this, we are trying to. If, if you go back, you can see that we are minimizing the negative of the disk loss. So this minimizing is really maximizing for us. And then the generator loss, you see it kind of, it starts at zero, it goes above zero, and then it kind of really um, goes, goes down fairly quickly and steadily. It looks like it's starting to curve out at the bottom there, though. But yeah, I, I'm pretty sure this is a failure to converge this this shooting up very quickly to me um, seems like the discriminator is getting too good too quickly like it's it's very obvious to the discriminator which images are fake and which ones are real um, so it's not it's not going to be very easy for the generator to trick it and spoiler alert <laughs> this did not generate letters that look like this. <laughs> It generated something uh, very different. So output. So after 200 iterations, you see they it still really looks like white noise. It's kind of clustering. I got really hopeful after 600 iterations. You see some white space. Like this could be an R. Um, that could totally be like a Q. And that could be a Q. This could all be Qs, really. Um, and then, but after 1,500 generations, you see... There's just a lot of white in the middle, which could be an homage to the letters. Maybe if you squint really hard, you can see a letter in this. Um, but the edges are really light gray, and I think what happened was uh, there are a lot of images that are hand-drawn looking and just didn't get dark enough pixelation. Um, so the generator, its best bet at tricking the discriminator is to put in these really light images that um, could be letters, could be like hand-drawn letters, could not be, um, but the discriminator might not be able to tell. So um, the generator loss function is decreasing at somewhat of a continuous rate. It looks like it might be bottoming, bottoming out, and the discriminator function shot up, and it's hovering, which is good, I guess, but it shouldn't be getting that good that quickly. So some things that I think would help. The quantity and the quality of the data. So if you see some of the images looked like this, so a pretty clear C or the W and the T that I showed at the beginning. Um, others were larger typography images. So the inconsistency, you can see this, this is not a letter, it's a bunch of letters, uh, probably confused the discriminator. Um, and with more time, the training set could be weeded out to useful letters. Um, it was also only 1,500 images and probably not enough, so more training data would really help this. Um, I also just resized the images. I didn't like crop and resize or uh, anything that would deal with the stretchiness, so anything like that would help. Um, the runtime, the model took maybe three hours to reach 1,000 iterations, so tweaking was a little challenging. Sources, so this is my first project in TensorFlow um, and neural networks, it was eye-opening. There's so much out there and this field seems to be changing every month at least. There's something new that's huge and everyone's um, everyone's trying to implement it, which is awesome. Um, the actual paper for WGAN, I believe, is this link. Um, if you're interested in the math behind this and uh, more of um, 
why why Wasserstein Gan versus a vanilla Gan. Right. Thank you for everyone for watching, um, and I hope that you can implement this on your own um, or try and run some demos that are elsewhere on the web. It's very cool stuff and and good to know about. All right. Thanks everyone.